What's up guys? So today's video is week three waivers and I'm going to go by position and give you guys some of the top pickups for this week. So the first guy is Justin Fields. Um, with the injury to Andy Dalton, there's a good chance that Fields is going to be starting next week. And if he does well in the next week or two while Dalton is out, he could definitely take over this job and be the starter the rest of the season. And with his legs and with the supporting cast he has around him, he would instantly be vaulted into that quarterback one conversation. And we all know what happens when quarterbacks have legs and passing output. Now, he didn't look great in week two, but I think his struggles are a bit overblown right now because... While he did have that one really just horrific interception, besides that, he looked pretty good. Watching the film, he had three perfect passes into the end zone that got dropped. I think one was by Mooney right off of all 10 fingers, and then uh, Robinson, I believe, dropped two of the other ones. Also, there were a few other drops that were on the receivers. Uh, I think Mooney had another one as well. He had a pretty bad game. And in terms of Fields rushing, he actually had a pretty good day rushing. Um, his final stat line doesn't really show it because he knelt the ball down three times to end the game. Plus, he had a negative rush that was really just him recovering a fumble after a guy came clean off the backside and swatted it out of his hand. And speaking of his legs, he almost had a rushing touchdown on a scramble in the red zone where he just barely tapped his toe on the sideline at like the three yard line. And he was getting zone reads called the whole game, even after we knew that Dalton was out for the game. Matt Nagy wasn't scared to let him run. And I think we can see that more going forward. Now his next two matchups are against Cleveland and Detroit. And obviously Detroit is an awesome matchup and we hope that he actually gets to play it in week four. Um, but week three is actually not as bad of a matchup as you might think. Detroit and Cleveland, they've both given up almost the exact same passing numbers over the first two games. 560 yards, five touchdowns, and Cleveland's actually allowed the opposing quarterbacks to rush for two touchdowns as well. So I could see Fields doing really well in one or both of these games and forcing Matt Nagy's hand and staking his claim as the starter the rest of the year. Now my second quarterback pickup is actually Daniel Jones. He gets to play the Atlanta Falcons in week three, and I think he could actually win you your week with this matchup. The Falcons defense is just horrible. They picked up right where they left off last season. Um, so far through two games, they've allowed eight passing touchdowns, over 500 passing yards, and allowed opposing quarterbacks to pass for a 72% completion percentage, which is just ridiculous. On the other hand, Daniel Jones has actually been playing really well coming into the season. Now, the Giants are 0-2, but I wouldn't say that it's all Daniel Jones' fault. Um, he's played pretty well. In both of his games, he's got basically identical passing stat lines of around 250 yards, one touchdown, no interceptions. Now, that's obviously not great, but he did that against pretty good defenses in Denver and Washington. So the fact that he's kept his play really clean, I mean, no interceptions and a 64% completion rate, that's pretty good. And his stats should honestly look a lot better because in week two, uh, Darius Slayton dropped like a 50 yard touchdown bomb that just hit him in both hands. And he also had his giant touchdown run. It got called back due to kind of a phantom holding penalty. And he lost 20 yards off that run and the touchdown. Even still, his fantasy performances have been 21 points and 29 points. And like I just said, that 29 could have been in well into the 30s. And those were against good defenses. Now he gets one of the worst defenses. So I expect his passing output to be a lot better in week three. And I think he's going to add to it with that rushing baseline that we've been seeing. Because to come into this season, they've actually been leaning on his running a lot more. I think a part of it is that Saquon is still being eased into his normal workload. And also their passing attack is still coming along with Kenny Galladay coming into the year injured. Uh, Kadarius Tony is kind of a non-factor, he hasn't really been playing much, and Evan Engram has been out with an injury. So Daniel Jones' rushing has actually been pretty substantial. If we take out the two quarterback kneels he has over the first two games, he actually has a rushing stat line of 13 carries for 124 yards and two touchdowns. And that's not Lamar Jackson, but that's pretty good added value. In week two, Kenny Galladay seemed to finally get into a rhythm with Jones, and he was also screaming at him on the sideline, so I expect them to make that connection even stronger in week three. I think Jones is a big passing day and I think he has a pretty good rushing day too to push him up into the top scorers of the week. Now moving over to running backs, my top priority guy is going to be Cordero Patterson. Now it's obviously still super early in the season, but with the work that Patterson's been getting so far, he's on pace to see by far the most usage he's ever had in his career. And with the way the Falcons offense has been looking, they're probably gonna need to continue leaning on him going forward. Mike Davis hasn't looked great, and without Julio there, the passing attack is leaving a lot to be desired while Kyle Pitts is still coming along. And Patterson has looked good. He's turned his 21 touches into 136 total yards and a handful of scores, and he's getting it in both the running game and the passing game. 
he showed that he still has his explosiveness on a like 50 yard swing pass that he took to the house. Although it did get called back to like the 20 because he skimmed the sidelines while breaking a tackle. But he still has the explosiveness and he has a pretty good role in this offense. I know over the years we've been teased before by his potential and we never really saw him get the right usage. He's always been kind of just a gadget player. But in Atlanta, he has a nice role. He's in on a lot of red zone plays, especially design plays specifically for him like carries and targets and even wildcat formation and he's the legit change of pace back to mike davis like he's not just getting third down work like mckissick he's not just getting two minute drill work he is getting that work but he's also getting work as the featured back on certain drives like he'll get power runs on first down and second down he's not playing a ton of snaps right now he in both weeks had identical snap counts and snap rates 24 total snaps 33 percent snap rate in both games but I don't think that's really a case of the Falcons only using him because of game script. I think it's more that they want to keep his usage low to try to keep him healthy. So if you were cool with rostering guys like JD McKissick or Kenny Gainwell or James White, where they really only have the passing down, the third down, the two minute drill role, Cordero has all of that. Plus he has the added role of being the change of pace back that they feature and they scheme up plays for him in the red zone. On top of that, on I think all fantasy platforms, I'm not sure if it's every one of them, but he usually has running back and wide receiver eligibility. So that just adds another layer to his value. Now my next running back, I just mentioned him a second ago, is JD McKissick. Now he should never have been on their waivers, but I can understand why somebody might have panicked and dropped him after week one. After all, we had all that hype in the offseason about Antonio Gibson is getting that workload this season. He's going to keep McKissick off the field. And in week one, that's actually what we saw. McKissick had his lowest snap count for all of 2020 in week one. And he had his lowest snap share in all of 2020 in week one. And on the other hand, Gibson had the highest snap percentage of his entire career so far. So a lot of people, especially if they didn't watch the game, they might have thought, oh, McKissick's role is shrinking. But really, it didn't. It was the exact same role that he had in 2020, where he was in on a lot of the third downs, um, the two-minute drills, and around the end zone. The problem was that in week one, those opportunities just weren't really there. They didn't run a two-minute drill to end the game, and I think they ran one to end the first half with like 55 seconds on it when it started. Also, they only ran plays in the red zone like once, maybe twice. Meanwhile, in week two, McKissick's uh, stat line jumped up a huge amount, even though his actual usage didn't go up that much. He only played like 10 more snaps in week two than he did in week one. It's just that with the context of week two, there was a lot more work for him in the two minute drills around the end zone on third downs. So now going forward with Fitzpatrick out of the picture for the time being and Taylor Heineke in, I don't know for sure that Heineke is going to target McKissick a lot, but we knew that it was kind of a negative that Fitzpatrick was in town because traditionally he just hasn't done that. So McKissick's role has not shrunk and with Heineke now at the helm, I think the arrow should be pointing back up for McKissick and you need to grab him. So my third and final top running back is Sony Michelle. So Daryl Henderson was on his way to dominating the snap share again in week two, but he suffered a rib cartilage injury and we're not sure how long he's gonna be out with that, if he's gonna be out but Michelle looked pretty good in relief. His final stat line was 10 for 46, but he actually looked a lot better than that because his final three runs were when the Rams had the ball in the Colts territory, in field goal range, they were already up a field goal and there was under two minutes to play. So they were just trying to drain the clock and the Colts were obviously signing out for the run and they just ran out the gut and those three runs went for five total yards. Apart from those runs, he actually had a six yard per carry average on his other seven runs. He definitely did not look washed, even though the Rams O-line really did all the heavy lifting on those runs, um, and the running lanes were just huge. Now, I don't say that to take anything away from Michelle, just to say that it's actually a good thing. Um, as long as he's not looking washed, this line is going to give him that opportunity to do that again. So he doesn't have to be in his prime to have really solid value here on this team. Now, that might not be the case this week because the Rams actually have to go play the Bucks, who have like the best run defense in the league. So I wouldn't start Michelle this week, but you definitely should pick him up and see if he works his way into a bigger role in this offense while Daryl is either out or limited. And then going forward, Michelle might have a role on this team. So now moving over to the wide receivers, the top priority guy, maybe across all positions, is Rondell Moore. Now, I think we're going to see this a lot from the Cardinals this year. Last week, Christian Kirk was one of the top guys to add. This week, it's Rondell Moore. Next week, it might be AJ Green. And I don't think that's to say that each one of these guys are just going to have the one big week and then fade away. I think that Kyler Murray is just going to go absolutely nuclear and all these guys are going to have volume that you're going to want to chase at some point. 
the target share in this offense is going to be a bit sporadic week to week. I mean, we just saw even DeAndre Hopkins got his target total from week one cut in half in week two from eight to four. And that's just because Kyler has so many weapons to work with. And right now, Rondale is probably the most explosive of those weapons. I mean, his 77-yard touchdown was probably the least impressive of all his catches in week two because it was a blown coverage and he just sprinted in a straight line. All his other touches, he looked like Tyreek, basically, where he was just making guys completely whiff, grabbing at air, and he was just accelerating stop-start like on a dime. It was pretty crazy to watch. And what's really exciting about Moore is that Cliff Kingsbury is designing plays to get him guaranteed touches throughout the game. He's getting sweeps, he's getting wide receiver screens, he's getting swing passes. They're just doing whatever they can to make sure that he gets a chance to make some guys miss. And he's looking really good on those short touches too. Now Rondell saw his snap share jump up from week one to week two, but it didn't actually come at the cost of any of the top three receivers. Uh, all three of them actually, Hopkins, Green, and Kirk, they all saw their snap share jump up as well a little bit. And that's because uh, Rondale's snaps came at the expense of James Conner and Max Williams, who both saw their snap share drop. I think we can see more of that going forward. We're gonna see more of four wide sets of empty backfield sets. And I think that if anybody's gonna be losing work because of Rondale coming up, it's going to be Conner and Max Williams, most likely. So right now, even with all four of those guys probably going to be relevant, and including Chase Edmonds, he's also gonna be relevant in the passing game as well. I think Rondell does have a really good mix of floor because of the guaranteed touches that Kingsbury is forcing his way, as well as upside because of just how ridiculously explosive he is. I mean, I think we're going to see a couple of multi-touchdown games right now in his rookie season. So my next priority add from the wide receivers is Michael Pittman Jr. And he really should not have been dropped in your leagues. I kind of saw this coming um, in my early season trade targets post that I made. I said, you might not even have to trade for this guy, but you should because he's probably gonna get dropped after week one. And in a lot of leagues he was, he was one of the most dropped receivers across ESPN and Yahoo. But he rebounded in a big way in week two, seeing 12 targets and catching them in for 123 yards. Now he didn't score, but he did get a couple red zone targets as well. But most importantly, he finally, finally was getting deep targets. Um, the vast majority of his 2020 targets and even week one and week two so far, they've mostly been short routes, in-breaking routes within 10 yards of the line of scrimmage. But in week two, he finally got targeted on some deep routes and he converted them. He got like a 40 yard post route and like a 20 something yard corner route, which is a great sign because as a big body receiver, you want that deep threat. You don't want him just being a slant man like Michael Thomas. So that's encouraging, but Carson Wentz just got injured. Um, he injured his ankle on the other foot, not the one he just got surgery on. So now he's got both legs compromised and we're not really sure if he's gonna play next week. So you have to keep that in mind for Michael Pittman going forward, at least in the short term. Also, it's important to note that Paris Campbell was out in week two and he usually is the deep field stretcher. So if he comes back in week three, we might see Michael Pittman, his route tree kind of shrink back to where it's been for the first you know, 16 games of his career. And a third really important factor is that in week two, Colts running backs only accounted for two total targets, and that is a major, major outlier in this offense. Um, in week one, Naeem Hines and Jonathan Taylor combined for 15 targets, and throughout 2020, the running backs were heavily involved in the passing game. In fact, Naeem Hines led the team in both targets and catches. So if the Colts are going to be rolling out Jacob Eason in week three, I think there's a good chance they go back to that really conservative passing attack where we see a lot of usage of the running backs both in the running game and in the passing game, and Michael Pittman is kind of relegated back to that short range route tree. So that could be good for him in PPR, but I don't think we can expect to see another 120 yard stat line right now. So my next priority ad is KJ Osborne from the Minnesota Vikings. And it might not be too popular to grab a guy who's the third receiver on his team, but you gotta understand that Kirk Cousins passes the ball a ton. And the fact that Osborne is playing exclusively out of the slot, Kirk Cousins targets his slot a ton. So even last season where Dalvin Cook saw 366 opportunities, which was the second most, uh, only Derrick Henry had more than him, and those two were like way above everyone else, Kirk Cousins still finished 8th in passing yards, 6th in passing touchdowns, and 13th in pass attempts. So even with a monster workload going to Dalvin Cook, he still threw the ball a ton. Also last season wasn't even close to the highest amount of volume that Kirk has output in this offense. In 2018, he threw almost 100 more pass attempts, and that was the season that Cook was still healthy. That wasn't the season that Cook basically missed the whole year. 
So there's enough volume to go around in this offense, and behind Thielen and Jefferson, there's room for a third pass catching option. And with Irv Smith out of town, I think it's Osborne. He's kind of coming out of nowhere right now because last season, his rookie year, he only played in nine games and he didn't get a single target. He was only used as a returner. But this year, he really impressed his team in training camp and preseason, and he leapfrogged Chad Beebe and D.D. Westbrook to get the number three spot on the team. And like I said, the slot receiver in this offense gets a lot of work. Thielen and Jefferson both have 17 targets each, and Osborne has 15 targets. It's really a Kubiak thing. After the Vikings transition from Kevin Stefanski at offensive coordinator to Gary Kubiak, the slot receiver became a lot more important in the offense. Um, Kirk's rate that he targeted the slot receiver went up, and the efficiency on those targets skyrocketed to the top in the league. Now, Gary Kubiak isn't actually there anymore. Now it's his son, Clint, but the offense figures to run the same way. It's the same system, and so far, the slot receiver has been heavily featured again. He's looked great in the underneath routes. He's getting really crucial balls, especially like late in the game in week two. He caught a pass to set up the Vikings for what should have been a game-winning field goal, uh, but the kicker missed a chip shot. And he showed he has that explosiveness on the, I think it was 65-yard touchdown pass. Uh, we can't expect that every week, but I think he has a really nice floor, especially in PPR. And my final guy for the list is wide receiver Henry Ruggs from the Raiders. Now, Ruggs is in a weird spot because on this Raiders team, Darren Waller is the number one option, and he's probably the number two option too, and sometimes he's the three. Um, Brian Edwards is playing more snaps than Ruggs right now, and Hunter Renfro is getting more targets than Ruggs right now. But Ruggs is that super explosive Tyreek clone, and he showed that again in week two when he got behind the Steelers defense for like a 60-yard bump. And while it's a small sample size, he is taking a step forward, it seems like, in terms of his usage from his rookie year. He has 13 opportunities through two weeks, being 12 targets and one carry, and obviously small sample size, but that rate would put him on pace for 110 this season, and last season he only had 52 total opportunities in 13 games played. Also, those 13 opportunities he just saw over the first two games, that's more opportunities he saw over any two-game stretch uh, across all of 2020. And the seven targets he just saw in week two is a career high. However, he's still playing on the exact same 66% snap rate that he saw throughout 2020, and Gruden isn't really making an effort yet to get him those guaranteed touches. He's not getting that Rondale kind of game planning where they're forcing short targets to him and letting him do stuff after the catch or after the handoff. So while I like what I've been seeing in terms of the usage uptick, I like to see more of it. Also, there's a major caveat here in that Derek Carr might not play, and if he does, he might be pretty limited. And I could see that Rose could disappear in a week three game script if he's only being used to run deep post routes. Especially since with Marcus Mariota injured, it would it could be Nathan Peterman throwing him the ball. So regardless of who is playing quarterback in week three, I think the Raiders lean on the run game really heavily and they lean on Darren Waller as always and probably Hunter Renfro. So there's a good chance that Ruggs doesn't have a very good game in week three, but I still think he's worth grabbing and monitoring because when Derek Carr is healthy and Ruggs is getting this level of involvement, I think he could have some monster games in store. All right, guys, that's going to do it for this video. Um, if you want to check out these players yourself, I have actually linked in the description a playlist that has all of my every play videos for these guys this season. So every play that they've put on tape so far in the 2021 season, it's all in those videos. You can check them out yourself before you decide whether you want to pick them up. Um, stay tuned to the channel because later this week I'm going to be posting another running back analysis video. You guys seem to really like those. It's going to be focused on a certain guy in Dallas who's been getting a lot of controversy, so stay tuned for that. Um, if you enjoyed the video, throw a like on it, consider subscribing, and I will see you guys in the next one.